morning, everyone. How's everyone doing out there? I need a little more energy. We're celebrating women. We're celebrating women who do big things. We're celebrating ourselves. We are here to kind of just be amongst these powerful women that you see all day today. So let me just get a little more cheer, a little more like hip hip right for the, for the ladies. For the ladies. Well, welcome to Diane von Furstenberg's second annual In Charge celebration of International Women's Day. Hi, my name is Rajni Jacques. I'm a creative consultant and the fashion director at Condé Nast. Um, for titles, now I do Allure, I used to do Teen Vogue, um, worked at Glamour, but now I'm hosting for you guys. I'm hosting for In Charge, which is such a great thing for me, and so super excited to meet so many of the women that you're gonna be listening to on the panel, women that you'll probably get to converse with afterwards. I'm kind of like, I'm fanning out myself on, on, you know, on the stage. Um, but we have women like Shaniqua Jarvis, uh, Halima Adam, uh, Sophia Bush. There's so many wonderful people. But to kick off the day, we want to get, you know, we, we want to get like a very, a very kind of like moving, inspired feeling. So we're going to kick off with an incredible woman who I'm sure you guys have all heard of. Um, she's a poet. Any guesses? Any guesses? <laughs> Um, she's a poet of our time, and her name is Rupi Kaur. She's a number one New York Times bestselling author and an illustrator of two collections of poetry, Milk and Honey, which graced a New York Times bestseller. And she's here for you today. And Emma Watson's a fan, I'm a fan, you're a fan, we're all a fan. So I need a big round of applause, I need claps, I need cheers. Please welcome to the stage, Rupi. holiday, international holiday all over the world. We should all get the day off and just hang out and do all the great things. Um, so, I have so much that I want to share with you. I have so many thoughts, ideas, but I'm going to try to squish all of them into about nine minutes. How does that sound? It might sound a little bit overwhelming, but I promise I come prepared. I want to start off with a poem called The Art of Growing. But before I begin, I want to share a little story about it. So I'm going to take it back to when I was in eighth grade. It was one of the worst years of my life. You know, eighth grade is not really kind to any young girl. And at that time, I mean, there was no internet. And so my awkward phase of puberty lasted very long. And I had no idea how to do my hair, makeup, look good, any of that kind of stuff. And so there was basically nothing happening for me in eighth grade except for the fact that my crush had his locker right next to mine. <laughs> Which basically meant that this was the beginning of our lives together. <laughs> and so one day after school, he leaned in really close and I giggled because I didn't know what else to do. No one had ever paid any attention to me before. And so by this point, he has, it's like the movies, like my back is to our lockers, he has one hunky arm over my shoulders, which I'm pretty sure was actually really scrawny, but that's another story for another time. This was like my Bollywood dream come to life. <laughs> I had basically been preparing for this moment since I was in the womb. You know, the hair on my arms was standing up, my heart was racing, and I could already see our future home and our seven children. <laughs> And he was seconds away from confessing his love. And I was halfway through naming our kids. But my heart stopped and he said, show me your boobs. Oh. And that was my reaction. <laughs> Except the shock wasn't really because he had asked, because I was kind of okay with that. Would have even showed them, but I didn't have any. <laughs> so I still don't know what this man was trying to see. And so I went home feeling confused and for the first time aware of all the womanly parts of my body. And years later, I wrote The Art of Growing because that girl in eighth grade who was in so many ways confused about her body really needed to hear it. This is The Art of Growing. I 
felt beautiful until the age of 12 when my body began to ripen like new fruit. And suddenly, the men looked at my newborn hips with salivating lips. The boys, they didn't want to play tag at recess. They wanted to touch all the new and unfamiliar parts of me. The parts I didn't know how to wear, didn't know how to carry, tried to bury in my rib cage. Boobs, they said. And I hated that word. Hated that I was embarrassed to say it, that even though it was referring to my body, it didn't belong to me, it belonged to them. And they repeated it like they were meditating upon it. Boobs, they said. Let me see yours. There is nothing worth seeing here but guilt and shame. I try to rot into the earth below my feet, but I'm still standing one foot across from his hooked fingers. And when he charges to feast on my half moons, I bite into his forearm and decide that I hate this body, that I must have done something terrible to deserve it. So when I go home, I tell my mother that the men outside were starving. She tells me I must not dress with my breasts hanging, said the boys will get hungry if they see fruit, said I should sit with my legs closed like a woman Ada, or the men will get angry and fight, said I can avoid all of this trouble if I just learn to act like a lady. But the problem is, that doesn't even make sense. I can't wrap my head around the fact that I have to convince half the world's population my body is not their bed. I am busy learning the consequences of womanhood when I should be learning science and math instead. And I like cartwheels and gymnastics. So I can't imagine walking around with my thighs pressed together like you're hiding a secret as if the acceptance of my own body parts will invite thoughts of lust in their heads. I will not subject myself to their ideologies because slut shaming is rape culture and virgin praising is rape culture and I am not a mannequin in the window of your favorite shop. You can't dress me up or throw me out when I'm worn. You are not a cannibal and your actions are not my responsibility. So you will control yourself. And so the next time I go to school and the boys say who at my backside, I push them down, foot over their necks and defiantly say, boobs. The look in their eyes is priceless. history that was full of so much pain and so much trauma for my parents' generation. And they were so hard pressed on, you know, keeping the culture and which was amazing, but you know, when you're nine years old, it's the worst. And it's funny because we live in Toronto, but when you entered my house, we were full on in Punjab. We ate Punjabi food, we spoke Punjabi, it was back home. And I hated it. I hated it so much because I was so embarrassed of where I came from and the language that I spoke, the color of my skin, and everything. And I think it was maybe when I was like 18, 19 years old, I finally began to embrace my identity with the support and love from the community around me. And when that happened, I finally began to see all of my parents' sacrifices as works of art and not marks of shame anymore. <coughs> And I wrote broken English for both of my parents, mostly for my mom, um, because 
She is probably the strongest woman in my life, one of the biggest inspirations, and the poem touches on so many intersections of gender and race and class. And yeah, I hope you enjoy it. I think about the way my father pulled the family out of poverty without knowing what a vow was. And my mother raised four children without being able to construct a perfect sentence in English. A discombobulated couple that landed in the new world with hopes that left the bitter taste of rejection in their mouths. No family, no friends, just man and wife. Two university degrees that meant nothing. One mother tongue that was broken now. One swollen belly with a baby inside. A father worrying about jobs and rent because no matter what, this baby was coming. And they thought to themselves, for a split second, was it worth it to put all of our money into the dream of a country that's swallowing us whole? And Papa looks at his woman's eyes and sees loneliness living where the iris was. Wants to give her a home in a country that looks at her with the word visitor wrapped around their tongue. On their wedding day, she left an entire village to be his wife. And now she left an entire country to be a warrior. And when the winter came, they had nothing but the heat of their own bodies to keep the coldness out. And so, like two brackets, they faced one another to hold the dearest parts of them, their children close. They turned a suitcase full of clothes into a life and regular paychecks to make sure the children of immigrants wouldn't hate them for being the children of immigrants. They work too hard. You can tell by their hands, their eyes were begging for sleep, but our mouths were begging to be fed. And that is the most artistic thing I have ever seen. It is poetry to the ears that have never heard what passion sounds like. And my mouth is full of likes and ums when I look at their masterpiece. Because there are no words in the English language that can articulate that kind of beauty. I can't compact their existence into 26 letters and call it a description. I tried once, but the adjectives needed to describe them don't even exist. So instead, I ended up with pages and pages full of words followed with commas and more words and more commas only to realize that there are some things in the world so infinite that they could never use a full stop. So how dare you mock your mother when she opens her mouth and broken English spells out? Don't be ashamed of the fact that she split through countries to be here so you wouldn't have to cross a shoreline. Her accent is thick like honey. Hold it with your life. It's the only thing she has left from home. Don't you stomp on that richness. Instead, hang it up on the walls of museums next to Dali and Van Gogh. Her life is brilliant and tragic. Kiss the side of her tender cheek. She already knows what it sounds like to have an entire nation laugh when she speaks. She is more than our punctuation and language. We might be able to paint pictures and write stories, but she made an entire world for herself. So how is that for art? And one last one. This one's called Timeless. And this is for every woman 
person in the audience who gets told time is running out or your best moment is gone and all of the other bullshit that they beat us. <laughs> they convinced me I only had a few good years left. Before I was replaced by a girl younger than me. As though Men yield power with age, but women grow into irrelevance. They can keep their lies, for I have just gotten started. I feel as though I just left the womb. My 20s are the warm-up to what I'm really about to do. Wait till you see me in my 30s. Now that will be a proper introduction to the nasty, wild woman in me. How can I leave before the party started? Rehearsals begin at age 40. I ripen with age. I do not come with an expiration date. And now, for the main event, curtains up at 50. Let's begin the show. Thank you.